Welcome to the Ken ISD Literacy Leaders and Coaches Network Remote Edition. We are excited to bring you our fifth episode of the LLCN Brief. We appreciate those that are now following us on your preferred podcast outlet and excited to share that we now have more than 600 unique listens to our four different podcast episodes. These listens come from nine different countries and over 23 different states. We appreciate that you are finding value in the information we are making available for you. Please continue to share our message with those that you know will also benefit from listening. With that in mind, we are excited to bring you more learning today. First, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Mark Raffler, and I'm the ELA and Social Studies Consultant for Kent ISD, and I'm joined with... Sarah Shoemaker. I am an early literacy coach with Kent ISD as well. What a year it has been. Many educators, students, and families have experienced learning differently during this time. We all might be pondering what impact these various formats of learning will have on the future of education. The idea of learning loss has been an increased priority in educational conversations since the COVID-19 pandemic first gripped our nation in March of 2020. It has been over a year and we are still unclear as the best ways to address it. Here in Michigan and specifically Kent County, we are working with ideas of recovery and reinvention of our educational systems. This work is ramping up as we are finishing up the current school year and looking ahead to educational opportunities this coming summer and fall. Getting a better perspective of student experiences during this time promises to be a big part of the future of education. We hope today's podcast will further support you in your thinking with this ongoing dialogue. Joining us today is Ron Berger. Ron Berger is the Senior Advisor for Teaching and Learning at EL Education, a nonprofit school improvement organization that partners with public schools and districts across America, leads professional learning, and creates open educational resources. He is a well-known keynote speaker and author and regularly inspires a commitment to quality, character, and citizenship in students. Thank you for being here with us today, Ron. You tell us a little bit more about your background and your current mindset in relation to the field of education. Thank you, Sarah and Mark, for inviting me. Um, I have been in education a long time. This is my 47th year in education, and uh, 25 of those years was full-time in the classroom. So I was a public school teacher in a low-income rural community for quite a long time, a few different communities. And then the past 20, past 20 years, I have been working with EL Education, coaching both urban and rural schools, school leaders, and teachers around uh, a model of education which empowers students. I've written eight books with my colleagues here at EL, and my real passion in, in education is this notion that kids can do way more than we believe they can. So sort of unleashing the potential of kids to do beautiful work. So important to think about the possibilities and the, the strengths of students in the classroom. We're excited to hear more. Thanks, Ron. So great to hear uh, about the empowering of the students. Certainly something that uh, we are working on, as Sarah mentioned and, and Ron alluded to. So Ron, after a full year of instruction altered by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are hearing this term of learning loss coming up quite frequently. What does learning loss mean to you and how would you recommend we handle this term in education? Thank you, Mark. I am concerned about the term learning loss and how prevalent it is in education right now. And I, I wanna say at first that I think everyone who's using that term has best intent. I think people all want the best for kids, educational leaders, district leaders, school leaders, teachers, we all want the best for kids. There's no bad guys in this story. But I think inadvertently, if we focus on learning loss, we're focusing with a deficit lens on kids, that what we're thinking of is what are they not good at right now? And I think that's the wrong way to open a year. I feel like as kids are returning this spring and then again next fall, it's so important to them to be excited together, to be together again, to learn in person. And we should be thinking about accelerating learning making learning more challenging, more engaging, more powerful now that we're together. Like we have this moment together after this historic 
awful period to just lean in together and do amazing, deep, challenging, beautiful work rather than think, okay, it's like after the challenge, we now have to sort you all and figure out where you're broken and what ways you're broken and how to fix you all. And the other reason it really worries me is that we, if we think about it in terms of loss and fixing kids, it puts kids in a passive position, like they're coming to school to get fixed for what they lost, rather than empowering them as leaders in that work. As, as we're ready to take off, you can lean into this and really grow in an accelerated way this coming year and, and look at them with an asset-based lens. Yeah, I appreciate that challenging, engaging, improving, and that positive approach to bringing them back. And just even that subtle term of opportunity, it just shifts that whole piece. And I, that was part of what really grabbed us in, in the message that you were sharing. And it really spins that positive approach and makes it exciting to get back to school versus something that we might be not looking forward to. Yeah, and I think if we look at, oh my goodness, there's so much damage we now have to fix, it's it's the exact wrong frame of mind to come into this with. I My wife is a nurse, and, and so the, this COVID situation of the past year has been really important to me. I also had surgery this year, so I had to go in and out of hospitals in the middle of COVID. And I have such admiration for medical centers, all the kinds of medical facilities that are working through this time. But I think it's really important that we remember schools are not medical facilities. We're not there to fix broken kids. I think a more helpful medical metaphor is physical therapy. Because after an operation, everyone, not everyone, but I did, but many of us have to go into physical therapy. And physical therapy is really different, right? Nobody feels guilty going to physical therapy. You don't feel like it was my fault. I, I did something wrong last year. You feel like, I'm done with this. Now I'm ready to rebuild myself. And I want to rebuild myself strong and even stronger. And the physical therapy is not getting fixed. It is those people in the physical therapist working with you to figure out how can you heal yourself? How can you fix yourself and grow yourself to become even stronger? And, and they will give you exercises and they will give you routines and they will give you lifestyle changes. And then it's up to you to make yourself a stronger, better person, stronger and healthier person from that. And I think that's the metaphor we should be thinking. Every kid needs a slightly different kind of therapy coming back that they will lead. And we can help them find where are the things they want to work on in the, in the strongest ways. They're not going to get fixed, just like the physical therapist doesn't fix me. We can empower kids to, to lean into their learning and think, I'm going to get way better at this. I'm going to get way better at this. And if there are some gaps from last year, I'm going to fill those gaps and, and I'm going to take, I'm going to lead that work. That is a really powerful metal, metaphor to use. And I'm sure it's something we all can relate to, to really help us look at this differently. Yeah. And I think. Assessment has to be a big part of this, right? Like we do have to assess where kids are, but there are ways to assess that disempower kids, that label them and rank them and put them in different categories. And if that's where we start by labeling and ranking kids and labeling and ranking teachers and schools and districts, then everyone feels guilty and, and feels broken and feels upset that things aren't where they should be. And it's a negative connotation for all of us. There are also ways to assess that are like, okay, here's my starting place. Now I'm excited to get in and really accelerate my learning. We need to use assessment that empowers kids. And it, it may even be the same kinds of assessments. They may be tests. They may be quizzes. They may be exercises that kids do. But how they are framed and how they are used is what makes the difference. If they're used to judge and rank and categorize, then kids feel stigmatized and teachers feel stigmatized. If they're used diagnostically, like your physical therapist does, you show up, your physical therapist says, Sarah, Mark, I need you to try this. I need you to try this. I need you to try this. Oh, okay. Now we know what you need to work on. You don't feel stigmatized. You don't, you just feel like now I know I'm going to do these exercises, these exercises. I need to make this stronger, this stronger, and this stronger. That kind of diagnostic assessment is essential and we shouldn't back away from it. The kind of us, the use of assessment I'm concerned about is saying these kids are, are way behind, these schools are way behind, this district is way behind. 
And so people feel labeled and stigmatized and it takes the heart out of their learning. I appreciate too, again, you continue to build on the helping change uh, the way we're looking at getting back to the opportunity. Yeah, and there should be genuine excitement. It's been awful to be a part. Teachers have done heroic things. Leaders have done heroic things. Kids have done heroic things. Families have done heroic things. But let's just be clear. It was just awful. Like this was an awful year. And the lack of excitement of being physically together and seeing each other and having to, to, to be so distant in this passive computer distant way has just been terrible. Like just terrible. There are, of course, a few kids for whom it was better this year, right? There are outliers for whom the social aspects of school were really hard and it's easier for them to be at home. But that's not most of us. For most of us, this was really a rough year. And so the return to school should be joyous. It should be so exciting. We're back together. We can really accelerate together. And by accelerate, I mean get into harder work than we thought we were going to do. Like make the work more challenging. Take on more. I'm not talking about backing off because kids are fragile right now and just being kind. And I'm saying rebuild stronger, like challenge kids when they come back, but do it in a positive way, like an excited way. Don't take the whole year going into remedial work because there's a true equity challenge now. If we say we're going to categorize all of you right now by what parts of you are broken, what parts of you need to be fixed, the kids who were unable to be online because they were homeless last year, because they didn't have internet connection last year, because they had to take on a job after school because of their family, because their family was displaced, because things were challenging in their, their, the, the physical or mental health of their family. Those are the kids who are going to get categorized as truly broken and then put into all remedial work. And the, the, the differences between those kids and the kids who had the privilege of being well-connected will get greater this year. So it will exacerbate the inequities of education if we take that labeling approach, that deficit approach. Ron, hearing about you talk about the passion and leaning into empowering kids in their learning and not spending so much time figuring out how to fix kids, but rather giving kids a starting place. We recognize that educators and students alike are putting in tons of intentional effort to return to the classroom. What should the focus of their time and energy be in regards to empowering students and student achievement? Well, I think, Sarah, we need to come in with that positive attitude about this is what we want to do this year. This is where we want to get to. Have a great vision for kids. That's an accelerated vision. Yes, we lost some time together last year, but this year we're going to make up for it by going faster and farther, harder, more challenging in a positive way. And if you found that there's some gaps because of your work last year, we'll, do, we'll work on those. You can lead that work with us. We'll make sure that if there are some gaps existing, that we, we deal with those. But that's a very different message from we're going to push you to a back room to catch up for the first half of the year before we let you do exciting forward work. The message should be, this is the time to lean into more challenge, greater kinds of projects, greater kinds of, of academic um, challenges and assignments so that kids feel like, wow, we're really like, we're diving right in. We're getting into exciting stuff. The work should be engaging. It should be pushing them. It should be beyond what they thought they'd be doing. That kind of like, that we should take this opportunity to think we've never in history come back from a year apart. Like now let's play into the positive energy of kids socially being back together again to dive into using all that social energy for academic rigor and challenge and excitement. Like, get into it. Be positive about it. And of course, there's going to be gaps. So some kids will need extra help. Some kids will need some tutoring. Some kids will need to work in pairs or work in teams or do some remedial groups in, in a small way along the way. But we're not going to push them out of the exciting work. We're not going to push them out of, of the, the flow of, of real challenge moving forward. We're going to set bold goals with them together. Ron, you speak from experience, many years of experience. Most teachers will say, how do I do this? How do I even start to form that engaging, challenging work when I'm, I have students all over the place with different experiences from the past year? So what would you say to those teachers? 
Well, it's not an entirely different paradigm in, in how we assess where kids are. So if you're an elementary teacher, if you're a high school math teacher, you need to know what do kids know and what do they not know. So it's fine to say part of our, this is where we want to get to together. One of the first things we have to figure out is where are each of you? Like, where do we need to work in the way that a physical therapist would work with you to say, where are your strengths right now? Where are the things that we know you're strong at? Where are the things we need to build some muscle? And so it's fine for to do some reading assessments with kids early on, some math assessments of kids early on, some general topic assessments in history and social studies and science to figure out where kids are, but not to do it in a way that they feel shamed or blamed in any way if there's a, if there's a gap there. We expect gaps. We were apart for a whole year. Of course, you're going to have some. But you should be creating your own profile. You should be able to articulate, where are my strengths right now? Where are my gaps right now? How do I develop a customized plan for me so I can get there all together. So, I mean, for 25 years when I was in the classroom, I was fortunate to be able to have kids lead a lot of their own assessment. They led their own family conferences. They led presentations of learning for the community. So that kind of idea, many schools use this now where students lead their own IEPs. They lead their own family conferences. They lead presentations for the community. They do exhibitions. Rather than have those be retrospective, after the year is done or the semester is done, telling your teacher and your parents where you are as a student with your work, we can be prospective in that work. We can have kids uh, share with their peers, with their teachers, with others, here's where I'm coming in. Here are the strengths I'm coming in with. Here's, here's what I learned last year. Here's what I gained last year. And then here's some things I need to strengthen coming from last year. I just looked at this assessment I did and this assessment I did. Here's something I need to focus on. Here's another thing I need to focus on. It's not a different assessment. It's using the assessment differently. It's using the assessment for kids to be in charge and be able to let you know, oh, in mathematics, I actually am pretty good in these things after last year, but I had a gap here. I just noticed in the assessment we just did, that's a gap for me. I got to work on that. And then another kid's got, oh, I have that gap too. We could work on that together or we could do this or maybe we can get some tutoring. Maybe we can do a study group around that. It, the difference is just having kids be leaders of their own learning versus passive patients that are getting fixed by us. That's the big push, I think. I'm sensing, Ron, that this is applicable, not just during this time of pandemic, but these are the best practices that we want to empower kids and, and students in our classroom of all ages to take the initiative to say, what is my profile for learning? Where am I at? And what path do I want to be on? And how will I navigate? Exactly right, Sarah. I mean, I, I feel fortunate. I work with this nonprofit. We have about 150 schools, uh, public schools across the country, mostly set in low-income, uh, rural, and urban communities. And we have a lot of high schools where every kid is getting into college every year. And that doesn't mean they all go to college. Some of them make the choice to enter their family business or to do technical work. But they all have the option of going to college, which is not at all the way I grew up. Like when I grew up, kids were sorted. You either had the option or you didn't. All these kids are having the option. And I think, what's the difference here? And one of the big differences is that kids are, they feel like they're in charge of their learning in those schools. There's clear learning targets in every course. And kids know, I've gotten to these three targets, but not those three targets. That's what I'm working on right now. And if you stop a kid in the hallway and you say, how are you doing in your classes? They'll say, in this class, these are the learning targets I've reached. These are the ones I'm still working on. In this class, I'm doing that. Like kids have a sense of, I am leading my education here, like as if they're in college. And I know I'm college bound because everyone in my school is college bound. Even younger kids in elementary schools will say, these are the learning targets of our day. This is what I'm working on. So the ownership has been shifted from, I come to school and do what I'm told, to I come to school to lead my learning. Like I have a portfolio of my learning. I can show you my portfolio of my learning. That, that shift is something I didn't experience as a student at all growing up. And I see it so empowering of kids in the schools that I'm fortunate to work with. Thank you for sharing your message about empowering students to analyze where they want to build their own learning muscle and to be leaders of their own learning and recognize the learning targets that they're aiming for. Yeah, and it's a change for teachers to make that clear to kids. When I was a teacher, my lesson goals, my lesson objectives were not ones that I made explicit to my students. 
I didn't change them into student friendly language. I didn't have students understand this is where we're trying to get to in this math lesson, in this English lesson, in this history lesson. I, I didn't make that clear. I learned how much better I could have been as a teacher had I made that explicit to kids and had they been able to be learners in that. And, and, and so for the last 25 years, I've been working with my nonprofit to try to help teachers in that process. And we, another thing we did is we created a free open literacy curriculum, uh, K to eight only, not high school, that builds in those learning targets and builds in those student empowerment uh, parts. And so if a teacher feels like, I don't know how to do this, they can just use the free curriculum and it builds in the targets for you and it, it, it builds in the structures where kids are sharing their thinking, sharing their goals toward reaching their targets, sharing when they have reached targets, sharing their, their understanding of problems with each other. So it, it can shift the pedagogy by scaffolding teachers along the way. Thank you, Ron. We'd appreciate it um, to be able to link that curriculum to this podcast as a resource for our listeners to access if you're willing to share that. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's used in a lot of places around the country. Um, in fact, all the students in Detroit are using it, for example, uh, K to eight students. So, and it's free. Everything is downloadable right from the website. And because it's Creative Commons licensed, it's, it's an open resource. People can modify it. They can change it. They can customize it for their own classroom. So a lot of our work is trying to provide free resources that help teachers make that shift toward empowering students. And I'm happy to share that and any of our resources. I also, um, Sarah, will share with you, I, I also teach at Harvard Graduate School of Education and with my students there and colleagues there and my colleagues at EL, I built the world's largest collection of student project work and student writing work that can be used as models. And that's also free and open source. So I can share with you the URL for our Models of Excellence website where teachers can download beautiful examples of challenging and powerful and beautiful student work in mathematics and science and history and English and all in arts in all topics. And teachers that are listening to this podcast can submit work to that website because there's a curation team, but the work comes in from all over the world and we keep loading up models. So if teachers think, what would a great second grade essay look like? What would a great science project look like for a ninth grader? We've got those examples there that they can look at with their students and, and think about as models. Our listeners love um, tangible resources, visual resources. So that will be wonderful, Ron. Thank you. And I'll list one more resource for you, Sarah, that I can share, which is we have about 400 instructional videos, also free and open source online, about how do you use learning targets in your teaching? How do you have students lead their own family conferences? How do you have students lead their own EIP, IEP meetings? How do you have students lead exhibitions of learning for their community? Um, again, all open source if they're ever useful to your listeners. I'm very happy to have people use them. We will gladly link those in our show notes, Ron. Thank you so much for sharing from your abundance. And my sustenance, Sarah, as an educator comes from visiting our schools and asking kids what they're working on and what they're learning. And it's so different than the experience I had growing up, where basically I felt like my job was to go to school and do what I was told. And I did well, I got good grades because I did what I was told and you know worked hard. I had no vision of like, these are the things we're studying and this is my goal and these are the targets I'm aiming for. This is my trajectory and this. And in contrast, when I go even to our elementary schools, kids are like, we're studying this and these are the things I'm working on and these are the things I'm getting better at. These are currently my challenges. This is where I'm struggling, but I'm getting way better at this. Like their understanding of themselves as learners is entirely different than what I grew up being. And I just love it. It's, it's so inspiring for me to have kids have that sense of who they are as a student and as a learner. Your work shape um, the experiences so that students have opportunities that are different from what you experienced as a young child. Absolutely. I was a very good student and got all good grades throughout school. And I have nothing from all of my years, kindergarten through 12th grade, that I still have. None of my work. Because I wasn't that proud of it. Right? I went to my teacher, I got graded, it came back to me. In contrast, I live in a small rural community where 
pretty much everyone under the age of 55 is my former student because I was the only upper grade elementary teacher, the fifth and sixth grade teacher for everybody in town. So when I run into somebody in town and they're 45 years old or 52 years old, they're my former student. They still have their portfolios of work from sixth grade. They still talk about it with me. They say, the blueprints we created, I still have those blueprints. The scientific report we created for the community, I still have that. I still have, it's like, they remember the work they did because they were proud of it, right? Because it was powerful work that they felt in charge of and they did important work in the world. It's so different than for me, where I just like, when my work was done, I threw it away and moved on because it was really the teacher's work, not my work. Ownership of the work is key. Okay, Ron, thank you so much for really getting at that idea around uh, the message for kids, right? Instead of coming to school to do what they're told, that empowerment and taking it and learning from it. So building on that as advice for students or what students need to hear, how might you continue to support families as they transition back to in-person learning over the next six to 12 months? Well, I think, Mark, that the most important message families and kids need to hear at first is that we care about them. I mean, kids need to feel like we care that you're safe, that you're physically healthy, that you're emotionally healthy, that you're mentally healthy. Like, we care. That message has to come clear. This has been a really rough year for so many families it, with financial health, with physical health, with emotional health. Like, this has been awful. And kids kids will need relationships with us as, as teachers. They need to know we care about them as human beings. Families need to hear that too. And so I think it's really important that we don't just immediately say, okay, yes, you're back. Time to get to your math. Before we make sure we check in, is your family okay? Is everyone okay at your home? Is your home okay? Do you have a home right now? Like, how are people doing? Is your, are your parents, uh, if you have parents there, okay? Is your grandmother okay? Like, do you, are there people that are still struggling? We need to, to make sure kids feel like we care about them as human beings and families need to hear that from us too. And it might mean that we need to support families in different ways. Like we might need to reach out to families who are in need in our communities and see what they need and how we can help them. And that should be something that classes and kids embrace, that we need to help all of our families too during this time. We need to come together. So a message that, that we as educators care about families and about kids themselves has to become a, just a regular part of the message kids are getting and families are getting in school. The same thing in what we send home to families in the, in the communication we send home, written communication. It can't be just, okay, your kids are back. Here are the things they need to catch up on. It should be, how are you doing? How can we help you? What do you need? Let us know how we can better support you. Families have been through a rough time and they need our support in that. We should come together as communities to support them. Next, families are going to feel like my kids are going back and they didn't have as good a year. Most of them, they'll feel like they weren't able to be online all the time or when they were online, it was hard for them to concentrate or hard for them to do everything on Zoom. And so we need to send the message. We're not here to fix your kids. You shouldn't feel panic to fix your kids. Of course, everybody suffered, but we're going to build together stronger. Like that same positive attitude that we have to give kids, we need families to have that positive attitude because we don't want Sarah going home to her parents and saying, what are the things you missed? What are the things you're behind on? We're really worried about you being behind. Like they could adopt that attitude if we message that attitude to them, that it's, this is about the, the, all the things that kids didn't get and all the ways in which they're deficient. We don't want parents to be thinking of their kids as deficient or broken or that it's anyone's fault that we had a pandemic. We want to be thinking, parents thinking this is an opportunity now to come back together and it's positive and be positive with your kids. And we're going to try to be positive with your kids about that opportunity. I also think that the structures I was speaking about earlier, student-led family conferences, student-led IEPs, student-led uh, presentations of learning to the community, exhibitions of learning, those kinds of structures are important because they bring families into the process because kids are sharing with their parents as well as with their teachers. Okay, we did a bunch of assessments at the end of the year. Now I have a real clear sense of where my learning strengths are and where I have to build my learning muscles. And if kids can share that with their parents, the parents can see my kid understands it and I understand it. I know how to help. And if Sarah's goes to her parents when she comes home from school and says, 
I'm really strong on this and this and this, but I missed a lot of my multiplication tables last year. That was something we were, would have worked on, and I just like it really fell off. And so that's one of the things I have to build my learning muscles for is my times tables between five and ten. And then if you're Sarah's parent, you think, I know just how I can help you. We can do flashcards together. We can do games together. Like we can um, figure out ways. We can make a concentration deck together and play it every evening. Like we can do stuff together because you've explained to me what are the goals that you need to work on. Framing it in a positive way, but being specific with parents about how they might be able to help is great. But kids can be the lead in that. We don't need Sarah's teacher reporting to Sarah's parent, oh, she's not strong in this right now. It can be Sarah saying, here's where I got to build my learning muscles. I got to work on my whatever. Um, and and they can think, okay, can we help you with that? Or how do we help you with that? But they'll see Sarah in charge of her learning and they'll be part of the process. We found that when schools have student-led parent conferences, family conferences, the attendance is way more than if you don't. Um, and that makes sense because a lot of parents didn't feel that comfortable in school themselves, that it's not that comfortable to go back into school. And if they're worried that their child is struggling, they feel guilty about that. They feel bad about it. They, they want to avoid the conference. They don't want to hear bad news. And so many parents feel a little intimidated and they don't show up for family conferences. Or it's hard for them because they're working two jobs and they can't get free during the parent conference slot So they, for that reason. But when their own daughter, when they see Sarah at home as their daughter preparing for her conference that they're going to attend, it's hard to want to skip that. Like you want to be there for your kid and listen to her frame her learning. And so we found in our schools that when they switched to student-led family conferences, that the attendance went way up for parents because they wanted to hear their own child explain how she's doing. Here are my strengths. Here are my weaknesses. Here are my goals. Here are the things I'm very proud of. Here are the things I need to work extra hard on. And then the parent is able to think, okay, how can we support you in that? So it's a very different message than a teacher saying, your kid is this, 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 and this. And then the parent feels guilty and bad. and like, I don't know what to do with that. So I, I just think... Um, those kinds of structures where students are leading and explaining their learning to their families brings the families into the picture in a different way. And so any ways we can do that at home and at school will make families feel more a part of the solution for their kids. Yeah, I appreciate uh, your lead with the social emotional learning uh, piece. I know that's something that's was really becoming a part of the conversation before the pandemic hit, but it's certainly been escalated uh, looking socially, emotionally and academically and trying to really connect with kids and appreciate that idea of shared ownership uh, term that you used as well. And I think in, in, in getting toward that end, I think you really hit on the idea of approach. We have been messaging, and as you mentioned, you're, you're rich with the experience, but we have been messaging. It's not like school to home communication is new. It's the approach of it. And you really keyed in on that, especially one example being the learning muscles. What a what a different way of setting up maybe what we would typically call an area of focus and learning, but more of that opportunity, that term and out, that term of learning muscles really helps bridge that. And I think too, you really overlap that or showed the overlap of what students need to hear, but what families need to hear. And the two are one and the same. And I think that really helps with that sense of building community, building and, and having a better approach and, and really overall your concept of shared ownership. That's, that's, that's something I think we can really take uh, as a powerful piece to pull that together. I, I will echo what Mark said, I think, Ron, that listening to your words there really made me realize invested students equals invested families. And so we've asked a lot of questions of you today and had some great conversation with your expertise being offered. What have we not asked about that is important to highlight here? Um, I'll add one more thing to that, and that's the organization I work with, EL Education, was born from two parent organizations. One was Harvard Graduate School of Education, and the other was Outward Bound. And you might have heard of Outward Bound as the wilderness organization. Yeah, um, some people think of it as an organization that teaches wilderness skills, but what it really does is teach character. 
in the wilderness. They, people don't go to Outward Bound to learn wilderness skills. They go there to learn to be a team, to work, to support each other. Everyone getting to the top of the mountain together. Everyone getting out on the ocean or down the river together. And so that had a real profound effect on us as an organization to what we focus on. And a lot of what we focus on is teamwork, about working together. And I think this reopening of schools is a perfect time to lean into this idea of teamwork. And I know that might seem like, oh, yeah, teamwork. It's like we all talk about that. We have posters on the wall with a crew and it says teamwork and all, you know. But the truth is that's not the way school works usually, right? So when I went to high school, my job was to get myself into college. Just me, no one else, right? And if my colleagues, my peers, my fellow students did poorly, it actually helped me because my class rank would be better, right? My grade point average would look better on a curve. There was no incentive for me to be helping everyone else. It was not a teamwork at all until I went to my, my athletic teams, right? So when I went on the soccer team, then it was teamwork. When I was in a school play, then it was teamwork. When I'm in an orchestra, then it's teamwork. But in class, it's all about the individual. It's about your, your problems, your needs, your intellect, your work. What if classrooms were more like the cast of a play or, the, or the, a soccer team or an orchestra? What if we thought our job is to help each other get better? And when we come back together after this, what if kids see their role as not just I have to work on my learning muscles, I have to help all of my peers because the better we do as a team, the better we all do. Like this is a teamwork approach. And when I visit our high schools, because they have this teamwork approach, we call it a crew approach because of our outward bound background, because they have this crew approach, when you say, how are you doing? They say, well, I'm doing pretty well, but a lot of my crewmates I'm still working on. I'm worried about Mark. I'm worried about Sarah. Like they're thinking beyond themselves. They're thinking of how do we help all of us succeed? And I think in this time of national and international devastation, what, a, what could be a better time to come back with kids and say, this isn't just about you. This is about how all your peers, all your classmates are doing. How can we help each other? Are there any of your classmates you're worried about? Are there any of your classmates you're helping? What can you do to help your classmates and their families? If you see a kid who's struggling with something emotionally, socially, academically, what can you do to help them? Like, Make this a team effort versus an individual effort. And I think that shift could really lift a lot for us this year. Um, because for all the teamwork posters we have on the wall, school is essentially an individual experience for kids because they see their job as getting good grades for themselves. And they don't need to see it that way. We can change that paradigm to my job at school is to help all my classmates do well also. Like we're a team and we're going to do better. And when parents think that's not school, all you have to do is say, well, what about when they're on a basketball team? What about when they're in a play? What about when they're in chorus? What about when, like, what about when they're on the debate team or Model UN or, or the school newspaper or any one of those structures? All of a sudden, it's absolutely clear to parents and kids, of course, that's a team effort. Well, if that's the case, why can't algebra class be a team effort, right? Why can't history class be a team effort? Like, why is Model UN have to be totally different than history class? I don't think it does. And so I think bringing that team spirit to reopen the year is one of the biggest messages that I'm trying to bring to our schools. Really gives us a lot to reflect on, Ron, in terms of how will we define our crew? Uh, what do we want the intention to be? And what will we as the adults in the classroom do to um, help students see themselves as a part of something bigger in this crew approach. Yeah, one of the, the stories that really moved me this year, Sarah, is right after the shutdown happened and schools closed, our students meet in small groups, advisory groups called crews, because that's part of our background. And we had a crew in New York City that the very first thing they did when they were able to meet on Zoom was where are there crises in our community that we should be helping right away? It wasn't like, as soon as we checked in on how are you doing? Anyone in your family have COVID? Any crises? Anyone lose their job? Anyone homeless? Like, okay, we got that done. Next step is what's going on in our community that we can help with. And so the kids organize themselves to look at the issues in their community 
which for them were pretty serious issues. It was people that were going to be evicted because they could no longer pay their rent. It was people who had family members who were incarcerated and they were worried that their family members would get COVID. It was people whose income was lost and so they didn't have enough food. And the kids were like, what do we do about that? How can we organize ourselves to make sure our community? And so this idea of our job is to be, as you say, Sarah, beyond ourselves. Like we're part, we're citizens of this world together. Our job is to think as soon as we're okay, how do we help others? It's just a very different way of thinking about school. It's evident that the crew that you have built within your organization and the work you're doing in schools, that they felt that sense of togetherness and empowerment, um, that they were capable of doing something in the story that you related. Thanks, Ron, for sharing. Well, we certainly appreciate, Ron, all of the insights and thinking that you've shared with us today around learning loss, but even larger, just looking at education, especially as we are coming back or will be starting to come back through the pandemic. And so your insights are very much appreciated and I will be taken advantage of by our listeners across the way. So thank you so much for your time today uh, and sharing the message um, that you were willing to share. Mark and Sarah, thank you so much for hosting me. And other than our books, which we can't give away because we publish them as books, everything else that my organization creates is free and open source. And so I'm hoping some of your listeners will find some of those things useful, um, the curriculum, the videos, the, the examples of, of student work, the models of student work, any of that. If any of those are useful, I would be really uh, happy to have, contribute something to your good work, all of you as listeners. So very much appreciate being invited to this. Thank you for joining us for this LLCN Brief today. If you liked this episode, think of a couple of other colleagues that may benefit from this content and share this podcast with them. The more people that listen, the more we can help them grow their craft. We appreciate Ron Berger's insight into re-engaging with students in classrooms. If you want to learn more about the resources Ron mentioned during our podcast today, check out our LLCN 2021 resources found at bit.ly backslash LLCN resources. Again, that's bit.ly backslash capital L, capital L, capital C, capital N, lowercase resources. All of the resources Ron mentioned today are linked in that document. We look forward to connecting with you again in the near future. We're also looking for suggestions on topics as well as questions that you may have related to literacy. So please take the time to let us know what you want to learn more about through our Google form, again, found at the bit.ly, bit.ly, backslash, capital L, capital L, capital C, capital N, all lowercase topics with no space. Thank you so much for listening.